Welcome to Crossroads. The Chinese Communist Party is pushing for plans to mine the moon. Now, a new proposal from Chinese scientists would be to construct a magnetic launcher that would work as a transport system in order to establish an Earth-Moon economy. Now, South China Morning Post said this. They said Chinese scientists have proposed building a magnetic launcher on the moon to provide a cost-effective way of sending resources extracted from the lunar surfaces back to the Earth. It says the magnetic levitation facility would work on the same principle as the hammer throw in, ath in athletics, but rotating at an increased speeds before throwing the launch capsule towards the Earth. It says by taking advantage of the moon's unique environment, such as its high vacuum and low gravity, it would be able to eject payloads twice a day at around 10% of the cost of existing transport methods, according to researchers from the Shanghai Institute of Satellite Engineering. Now, further it states the proposed launch system would use a 50 meter, about a 165 foot, rotating arm and a high temperature superconducting motor to launch capsules loaded with lunar resources. After 10 minutes, the rotating arm would reach the moon's escape velocity of 2.4 kilometers per second, about one-sixth of Earth's escape velocity, to put it on the correct trajectory to return to Earth. It says the system would be powered by solar and nuclear energy. This is important. It notes that with more than 70% of the energy recovered from each launch, thanks to a design that would allow kinetic energy to be converted back to electricity during the deceleration phase after the launch. Now look, they go on to mention that this would be part of their plans to develop space mining systems, aimed specifically at the moon, to mine helium-3. And they said that would help address the Earth's energy crisis. They estimate the Earth has around 0.5 tons of helium-3, while the moon is estimated to have around 1 million tons, so a whole lot more. Now, this, of course, ties in with something else. There are growing ambitions for fusion energy. This is kind of the next generation of nuclear energy. Only rather than working on nuclear fission, which the current ones do, this is nuclear fusion. And although it's still hypothetical in a lot of ways, they haven't really been able to make it work. Uh, if they do make it work, that's the future of the world's energy. And if that works, they need helium-3. And because of that, the moon is seen as kind of the next frontier of mining because it has helium-3. Now, on the launch system itself, if the Chinese Communist Party were to build it, it would also mean the CCP would have to, as they mention, build solar and nuclear energy stations on the moon. They would have to build energy systems on the moon itself. Meaning, think about it, you'd have to have, of course, full-blown mining operations, which means systems to sustain the mining operations, meaning moon bases, unless they do it autonomously, systems to keep, again, humans surviving there, probably in large numbers, if not just a few of them, just to maintain the systems. You would then have to have systems to transport it, systems to launch it, and systems to power the entire thing. And so this would mean the establishment of a full moon system. And the big question here is, well, who would own that? Who owns the moon? And if they were to build systems like this, they would have to establish, again, the entire infrastructure, the entire trade route. They would have to secure that trade route. They have to make sure that satellites or space shuttles or whatever else are not entering that meaning they would be able to deny access to other countries looking to access that. And that, of course, is one of the big concerns for the United States. Because the concern with the CCP is its broader ambition to control what they call the CIS lunar system, the space between the Earth and the Moon. And if the CCP can control that, well, they can weaponize that. Now, interestingly, the Chinese Communist Party is saying, these scientists at least, are suggesting that they work with Russia on this program. And they say this could be part of their ambitions to build a research station on the moon's south pole by 2035. And so, as along with this, again, there's an entire new competition, a new moon race taking place. Not over just who lands on the moon, but who owns the moon. Because whoever goes there and claims that they own a certain region of it, well, you're going to have to contest that. And if you want to contest, you might even have to fight for it. The Chinese Communist Party or the United States can claim, hey, we own this part, you own that part, or one of them can say, we own the entire thing. And when it comes to the ambitions with this, there's a lot more to it. 
The Chinese Communist Party and Russia notably have other ambitions tied in with this. And what's important here is that this is not just a single ambition. There's other things tied in with this. The Chinese Communist Party right now is looking at the cis lunar system, the moon. They're also looking at undersea areas. But they're also looking at something else, which is, of course, the Arctic. And both countries, Russia and China, are also moving with their ambitions there as well. Newsweek said this. They say China and Russia are looking to work more closely together in the Arctic, including in science. A senior Chinese official in the, for the polar region said during a visit to a territory that is part of Norway, and a potential challenge, notably, to a NATO member. Now, the issue with the Chinese Communist Party aiming to carry out operations like this in the Arctic are actually similar to the ambitions with the moon and space and so on. It means they're going to be trying to claim this territory. And they call the Arctic, of course, one of the strategic high grounds because if you were to launch ballistic missiles, if you were to launch air attacks against the United States, you'd probably go through the Arctic. But, of course, it also ties into something else. They're trying to claim territory there. And they're doing this, again, under the guise of maybe mining for minerals, of you know, doing oil wells and so on, of establishing an economy there. Because once you build an entire economic system, you have to have infrastructure to power it, meaning power stations. You have to have, of course, individuals there to run it. You have to have systems to sustain those individuals. And then you need something to defend it. And so the CCP, by establishing different areas like this, can build systems around it. Now, the concern over civil military fusion ties in with this as well. The Chinese Communist Party, when it's in, with its interests, again, whether it's the moon or the Arctic or even undersea, any kind of operation it carries out entails not just, again, business and science. That's also closely tied in with the CCP in both areas with its military. And notably, because they're doing this, it's aligning as well with this whole kind of great coupling taking place. I'll be talking more about this after we come back from a quick break. Welcome back. Scientific collaboration between the U.S. and China, it's on the decline. And as this happens, concerns over civil military fusion and the Chinese Communist Party's interest in it are starting to get hit by the great decoupling now taking place. Now, Nature said this. They said China-U.S. research collaborations are in decline. This is bad news for everyone, according to them, right? They note further in that China's scientific collaboration with other countries has declined since the pandemic, driven by falling partnerships with the United States and analysis shows. And as scientists have been warning that political tensions between China and the United States combined with the pandemic have affected research collaboration between the two countries. But it takes time for evidence of this sort of decline to accumulate in research databases, it says. Now, notice that in 2022, the total number of papers co-authored by researchers from China and their international peers declined for the first time since 2013. And notice that one individual, Zhang, said that ongoing geopolitical tensions between the United States and China have also fueled the decline, saying, quote, This is especially worrying for researchers. And notes that the U.S. Department of Justice is controversial China initiative, which was launched in 2018 to tackle espionage and re the research industry. That ended in 2022. But notes the crackdown resulted in several scientists being arrested over their ties to collaborations or institutions in China. You might remember all these different researchers being charged as taking unregistered foreign gifts and so on. And that is also, it says, stoked fear among researchers of Chinese descent. And it's that since then, the U.S. government has adopted a range of policies focused on tightening research security. And in July of 2023, the Chinese government, the CCP, implemented its revised counter-espionage law, which broadened the definition of what constitutes spying, meaning the researchers are squeezed on both sides. Now, notes the crackdown on perceived foreign interference in both the United States and China is making researchers more cautious about collaborating, according to this individual. <laughs>